four new people have just registered at this moment. <laughs> just oh, coming wow. through. So let's let's make a start. We'll obviously let more people may well join us as we go through. So welcome everyone to the webinar today. Uh, it's called the Mindset Shift Every Job Seeker in HR Needs to Make. Uh, my name is Nick Day. I'm CEO and founder of JGA Recruitment Group. We're actually a specialist human resources and payroll recruitment firm. And I'm also the host of the HR L&D podcast. So it's a sector I know very well. I've probably seen over a million CVs in my time. I've arranged multiple interviews and worked with some of the uh, the world's greatest brands to place HR professionals. So hopefully I've got some knowledge to help you. I'm joined today by Super Tell, who's an international leadership consultant, HR thought partner, author, speaker, coach, and mentor specifically for HR professionals. And today she's gonna to be sharing her blueprint that's been helping hundreds of HR professionals across the globe land the right role for them. And she's gonna be teaching you how to get clear on what is what it is that you want, help you develop a self-image and personal branding, branding that can really empower you as well. I should also add, I'll give a little plug here for Sue, that she's also the author of a book called Putting the Human Back into HR, Success as an HR Professional Begins with You. So um, there'll be a link I'm sure we'll, we'll add later on if you want to have access to that book. But it does provide leaders with human um, within human resources with solutions to build credible brands for people. So uh, really excited to have Sue join me today. Um, Sue, anything you want to add? Yeah, I just want to say, you know, thank you for the lovely introduction and, um, you know, hi to everybody that's on the webinar that's taken some time out this afternoon and um, really hope to give you lots of value, um, some takeaways that you can really implement. Um, I'm very much about, you know, not sharing more information, but actually giving you things that you can actually go away and implement and take action on. So really excited to be here. You know, Nick and I will be sharing our strategies, just how to be more visible online and offline. Excellent. Fantastic. Yeah. I think with everything Sue's just said, we've been working and collaborating together with a number of uh, HR small coaching groups as well to really make that happen for people. We'll try and give some examples of that a little bit later on. As we mentioned at the start, if you join us a little bit later, if you have any questions as we go through, put them in the chat in real time. We'll try and answer them in real time rather than do a Q&A at the end. I think it's better to hit it hard and early. So if you've got any questions, problems, anxieties, challenges you've been faced with, um, anything that you really, as hurdles you're struggling to overcome in relation to your personal job search or personal branding, then put it in the uh, chat and we'll try and address those as we go. Now, to set the scene a little bit, I am an HR recruiter. As I said earlier, I've witnessed firsthand the challenges that HR professionals have been faced with, particularly during this pandemic. I don't want to focus too much on COVID-19. There's enough other webinars that do that. But I am here to tell you that with the right mindset, the right tools and the right knowledge, you can still get ahead regardless of what is happening in the market today, regardless of economic turmoil and all that jazz, there's always a, a way that you can get ahead if you follow a right strategy and have the right mindset. I can tell you as an HR recruiter, we're still in business, we're still recruiting positions across the UK and opportunities do exist. HR talent is still very much in demand as is talent across other sectors as well and companies are still recruiting. What I'd like to do, though, is ask Sue how she's seeing the market. Sue has obviously come from an HR director level background for huge employers like Tesco. So what have you been seeing in the market recently, Sue? Yeah, so um, thanks, Nick. I think for me, what I've seen with many HR professionals, you know, whether they're in current roles or whether they're looking for new roles, is a lot of anxiety, um, quite a lot of um kind of mindset work really where you know whenever I speak to a HR professional and I say right what is it that you want to really work on you know with within a coaching program and 90% of them will say things like I'm really dealing with self lack of self-belief I'm dealing with imposter syndrome I'm dealing with like um, you know perfection and that you know paralysis you know and um, really just feeling like I'm not at the top of my game in my role so those are people who are in the you know in current roles you know people who are looking for jobs you know one of the things that they're doing is they're just applying for any job and every job out there and it's exhausting the rejection is adding to their already lack of confidence um, you know and they're just like feeling desperate really and I just want to really today spend a bit of time you know, talking about what will really help you take that frustration away and um, take the ex exhaustion out. And, you know, just actually, my one advice to you already right now is just relax, you know, um, and really spend some time reflecting and spending some time on you 
right? Now, I don't mean that in a way where, you know, I want you to go out and hug a tree or anything, right? But it really, in terms of getting to know what your values are, what you really want, and getting connected with that first, because um, literally I was speaking to um, a guy very recently, he's, he's from a HR background, and he's like, you know, I'm really looking to progress in my career, and I don't know where I'm going next. You know, I've done this role, but I moved into this role because it's providing me with the flexibility and the hours, and now I'm able to have a life now. But actually, now I'm thinking I want to go into this role. And I said, okay, why do you want to go into that role, right? And he said, because I love process and I love structure. I said, let me ask you something, right? Is the more, when you think about any job or any, anything that you do, a business that you do, you've got to really think about what difference do I want to make rather than thinking about what is the job going to give me? Because when you think about what the job gives you, um, you're, you're, it'll give you the short-term things that you want, but you will still never feel fulfilled. So you've got to look for a role that's going to give you fulfillment. Like I loved my role in Tesco. I loved it so much. I loved the people. I loved what I did because I was there making a contribution to people. The whole point of me going into HR was because I wanted to be a voice for people. So what I'm seeing a lot of at the moment is people not really connected to their why. You know, what? why are you going into HR? Why are you going into that role? What are you going to give to the organization and to the people? So if you start with that. So I'm going to then... slow things down a little bit because we're going to get to what is your what we call your blueprint soon. I don't want to give all the, yeah. everything away too yeah. soon. I think what, what's important we do Got before it. we get into it is everyone's in a different position right now. We know that anxiety levels are going through the roof. People yeah. are struggling. I've seen it. I'm trying to help job seekers with CVs and with interview advice and, and confidence boosts and trying to pick people up because the energy goes low when you're feeling down, right? So mm. what I want to do first and start not bring the, the webinar down, but I want to anchor the <laughs> webinar so that we can only go up from this point. And I think it's, yeah. if you don't mind me saying it, it's a really good place to start would be your personal journey because you have been through where I know a lot of our uh, viewers right now will be, would have, uh, be going through at the minute, a similar kind of story where you did struggle for a little while to see the positives and you had to pull yourself out of it. And I think if we can yeah. anchor it with your personal journey to begin with, I don't want, I think everyone would love to hear it because it's, it's also an inspirational story. But then also I think from that would be great then if you could share some of your blueprint going forward, which which is what you were just about to get into. But do you mind if we just anchor it with your personal story yeah. first? I think 100%. Really yeah, 100%. I was running away with myself. I was on yeah. my soapbox there. <laughs> I know how passionate you are about it, awesome. which, is great, which is great. Yeah. So, um, you know, in 2016, I um, was a real you know, life changing year for me. And, um, you know, I was in a place where many people are now. And um, I've literally separated from my husband in the February, thinking I'm going to be fine. I've got a job, you know, it's all going to be great. And I'll take care of it. You know, I had a daughter who was about 10 at the time. Um, and lo and behold, the following month in March, um, you know, I got told that my, my role was going to be made redundant. And there wasn't another role to go into because they were streamlining the structures within Tesco at the time. And so I found myself, you know, now a single parent and no job. And the following month in April, I had to sell my house. You know, so within three months in 2016, I went from a very secure, you know, really great paid job, all the security, all that kind of stability of income. Um, having a family network, living in my own home, to being a single parent with no job, no income, and living in a rented home for the first time. And I just found myself in a place of like, oh my God, like what's just happened? It felt like the rug had been pulled from underneath me. And, you know, I was like, what is just, what is happening? And suddenly I found myself thinking these thoughts that, you know, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, like I've got nothing now, I've got nothing, no job, no family, you know, I was living with, I was dealing with the guilt and the worries and anxieties of being a single parent now and have I done the right thing, um, so dealing with all of that as well and, you know, by this time I was like, you know, loads of things have happened in my life over time and I was like, why does stuff just keep happening to me you know why does it just keep going wrong and I was just really just I'm just tired of things going wrong and um I had this thought in my head like what if I just gave up like what if I did just give up because I'm just tired of this 
and I had this image of myself sitting on the you know on the sofa with you know not you know not dressed not you know not had a shower just live, sitting in my robe with like you know really weak and withdrawn and my daughter coming home from school and you know checking in with me and saying mommy like are you okay shall I put the dinner on and stuff and I was like oh my god if I gave up my daughter is going to be left with the responsibility to take care of me like she doesn't deserve that you know so I really got very quickly that it was my mindset that was holding me in that space you know I just felt like I had nothing and I kept telling myself I was worthless in fact I even went for an interview with Sainsbury's and I spent two weeks preparing for the interview uh, because I thought I know retail I'll just go and do you know I'll just go in quickly just you know go into retail you know go into another retail company and um, as I said I spent two weeks preparing for the presentation went for the interview and you can imagine I had all these thoughts of not being good enough not being worthy and you know feeling desperate and there was no way I was going to get the job, you know. So I find myself like um, just going round and round in circles. And I knew at that point that it was my mindset that was having me be at rock bottom. And you, and found, I knew that that you. you found your wall yeah. because you had that image of your daughter and that got you yeah, back in the top totally. of mindset. And to, to fast totally. back and forward into the positive side of things now, that was kind of the part of your journey, which now you can fall back on to, to support those you've been supporting in your coaching journey with HR professionals, where you talk a lot about what is now your blueprint, helping people find that why, helping people change that mindset at a real granular level as well. So to bring it back now to where you were before that little story, I just wanted people to know, because it's very easy to go to a webinar and watch people talk about how people should change mindsets, right? Not understanding that, maybe these talkers haven't been through it themselves. And I think it's really important to know yeah. that you have been on that journey and now you're supporting yeah. others with their journey. So let's bring it 100%. back to the blueprint side of things. What are you doing now to help HR professionals who are feeling anxious to really shift their mindset? What can they do to really get back on the horse, if you like, and go, right, actually, I need to find my why. How do I do that? How do I take yeah. the next action? How do I move forward? Yeah. Awesome. And everything that I teach on my coaching programs is through experience, right? It's not things that I've studied for a book and I'm now sharing with people, you know, it's actually the things that I did to get myself to where I am now, sure. you know, and one of the first things is like, you know, really asking yourself, like, what is it that you really want? You know, and I did a post about this a couple of days ago is that often we just focus on work or our career. But actually think about what you want in your life. What kind of things do you want to have going forward, right? You know, like, how do you want your health to be? What kind of relationships do you want to have? What kind of person do you want to be in your future? And really getting clarity around that. What is this new identity you want to create for yourself? So one of the first things that we do is we look at our goals and creating a vision for where we want to be. And that was one of the first things that I did. And I was just sharing with Nick, Nick earlier about creating this vision board, um, you know, and um, that's what I did. That was my first starting point. I created a vision board, which is like a map of what I want to see in my future. Because when you don't have a map of what you want to see in the future, you end up putting things in there that you don't want, you know, like the worries, the stress, the anxiety of what, will, what might go wrong based on what you already know, right? So actually, by creating a vision of what I do want, you know, I had something to inspire, you know, something that to inspire me every day, get out of bed every day. So creating a vision and having that clarity on what is it that you want is the first step. Then the second step is really to look at, like, what's this identity that you want to create for yourself? Because a lot of us are walking around thinking we're not good enough. Uh, we don't we don't have what it takes. And we see, see ourselves as being very small people, contracted small people living in this world of just our own. But actually, as I said earlier, when you start thinking about who you want to be for people, who you want to be for your family, your friends, your colleagues, your business, you suddenly start to grow this new identity, this new branding, this new image of yourself. And that's so important to do and really getting clear on what that is, right? And then there's some habits that go with that is how do you get to be that person? You've got to start creating some habits and routines that will help you get there. So visualizations, affirmations, that kind of stuff. And don't underestimate the power of those things, right? And then the third area we really look at is um, 
visibility. One of the biggest things that HR professionals uh, or the biggest mistakes that HR professionals make, right, is that, you know, we hide, we're hiding behind behind um, a screen, if you like, you know, many people show up on webinars, they don't show their faces, right? They, you know, it's like they're hiding, they don't want to be visible. Yeah. Why not? You know, what's behind that? And often what's behind it is fear, fear of being judged on how I look, how I sound, what I might say, fear of like, you know, saying the wrong thing, all of these judgments, but actually those judgments are not necessarily what people have of you it's a judgment that you have of yourself yeah from something that's happened in the past um, and one of the things that we talk about in the program is actually what are the stories that we made up in the past that we're reliving constantly you know as an example you know you might have put your hand up in school when you were young and got the question wrong and everybody laughed so you might have decided that i'm never going to do that again i'm never going to speak <coughs> up again i'm going to jump on your last coaching course, this was quite um, interesting for me because I was, inv I'm involved, was involved in the final week of the course. And actually for you had a lot of people on the course, and I was surprised at just how many people raised their hand in relation to issues that had happened to them way back at school that was affecting yeah. them in their, in, in their work now, affecting their confidence now. It was a mass teacher saying you're not good enough or, you know, putting pressure on or someone putting a hand up and giving a wrong answer and everyone laughing at them. I think it was another example that was given. I was really surprised. I think I'd completely forgotten what I did at school now. It had never occurred to me to look back, but it was amazing how many other people actually were affected, how much the confidence was affected by things that happened so long ago i've put a couple of questions in the group following um the, 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 some of the points you've been giving there sue so if, anyone ha if anyone's brave enough to answer any of these questions publicly please do put it in the chat and we'll try and address those as we go as well but just to bring it back to that visibility and that that bravery piece if you like we talked uh, recently about how 20 seconds of bravery can abs absolutely make a huge shift in people's lives if you're willing to do it if you can hold your you know take a deep breath and focus on doing something for 20 seconds, whatever that might be. That might be your first post on LinkedIn. That might be approaching a CEO about a job when you've already applied for it and not had a response. There's various things you can do. Most of us sort of shy away because we can't, don't give ourselves that much opportunity to do it because we're not willing to be brave enough. And we assume that bravery needs to, needs to last. It doesn't. It's about taking that first step, taking that first action. And usually that will happen in, within the first 20 seconds. Now, from a job flow perspective, one example could be for this as a strategy you could take away. For those of you that are struggling with multiple applications, you're using the easy apply button on LinkedIn, for example, you've sent it out to 30 companies, you've not got any feedback. Nine times out of 10 on a job description, it will tell you who that role reports to. And within that role, let's say it's the HR director, maybe it's the CEO, CFO, chief people officer, whoever it is, if it gives you who that person is, why not follow due process, press the easy apply, make the application to the talent professionals on the other side. But there's nothing stopping you from taking 20 seconds worth of bravery and sending an email through to the person that role reports to and say, look, I have applied through the right process. I'm not going out of process and doing this, but I'm really interested in your job. It's a brand that really inspires me. The role profile fits exactly what I want to achieve and what I want to do. This is not just any job for me. This is the job that I want. And actually, from a hiring manager's perspective, that's what they want to hear. With the market, so so many people looking for jobs at the moment in the market, there are so many people that will take any job. Therefore, from a hiring manager's perspective, they're not looking for people that want any job, they're looking for people that want to work for them as the job. And if you can make that distinction in your application process, if you can demonstrate that actually, I haven't just applied to 30 places, whether you have or not is irrelevant, this is the job for me, that will really resonate. And it will really resonate as well if you make that application direct to the person who's going to be responsible for that hire. And I would still recommend you follow due process as well and still apply through the talent acquisition uh, panel or apply button. But there's nothing stopping you from taking taking a lead that no one else is doing. I think if you throw stuff out there and just hope something sticks, hope someone comes back to you, you're living on hope. You can be a lot more proactive. And this is where, to bring back to what Sue was saying, we have your goals and your habits and your, your mission statements. When, you, when you've got those things aligned, it's much easier for you to take a proactive step. Sorry to just jump in there, but I was so, it was, it, I was so surprised at how many people raised their hands, um, Sue, in that particular example. And it's amazing the fears we hold on to. Obviously, you've got yeah. more experience in that area than me. Yeah, absolutely. And... 
you know, like what one thing that I would say to everybody listening is like, you know, don't apply for a job out of fear because you're not going to get that job. You know, it's going to show up in your application. It's going to show up in your interview that you're, you know, you're you're actually applying for it out of fear, out of desperation. You know, so yeah. almost yeah. sometimes what you got to do is let go of all of that. Take the, you know, take the stress and the tension away from you and just sometimes just take a break from applying for jobs. Yeah. Do the work and get connected to what is the ideal job. Write out what the ideal job is. And then look for jobs that work in line with what you want. All right. Um, I spoke to a HR professional very recently, actually. And she said, oh, I've applied to 30 jobs and I'm not ill. I get a rejection, rejection, rejection. I said, out of all of those jobs, how many jobs are actually ones that you really wanted to do? And she said about four. You know, so I said, well, why are you, you know, doing that to yourself you know it's just going to add to your you know your confidence that you're you know you're getting rejected all the time like it's not going to do you any good sure. so just stop sure. for a little while take some time out get connected to who you are and then apply for jobs that are what you want and also as i said earlier is think about what you can give the job like nick's already said right is think about the job you know people want to know what you can do for them you know don't just look at it as a what can they do for you you know this job's going to give me the the money this is going to give me the hours or the you know the the status or whatever that is right the job title whatever but actually think of what you can bring to the role and the people and whenever you're interviewing when you're really doing it from that place it will come through and i've had people who have attended my coaching programs who have done exactly that and within two three weeks of the four week program nick like they've gone and got jobs which is incredible yeah. Yeah. let's focus on that point for a moment. we've had a couple of comments in there one from michelle which is great it sounds like michelle's got the right angle here she starts to look at positions that are on your terms michelle so that's great um you know get your goals aligned know exactly what it is you want to do and make those applications and steve said you know what point do we cross the line when it comes to following up application and testing well let me just focus on that a minute as a recruiter I get a lot of people following up on applications on a very regular basis. So I'll try and give um, what I would suggest as being the kind of correct protocol on this going forward. I've got a question in from Joe as well, which I'll address in just a moment. So a couple of things to think about. Number one is we often apply for jobs with the mindset of this is what I want. I think Sue just mentioned that. I want more money. I want a job. I want to be employed. I've got bills to pay. I've got a mortgage to pay. I've got kids to support, whatever it is. And that's great. We often forget, though, that actually most people reviewing applications and hiring positions and even interviewing, they, they're, they're as terrified, terrified of interviewing as you are of going to the interview. Most coaches and managers that are hiring for positions are not trained in interviewing. They don't love interviewing. It's not what they're paid to do, particularly they're paid to, to manage you know, HR functions, for example. And interviewing is not part of their skill set that they, they love to embrace. So if that's the case, we want to make it as easy as possible for them to make that interview as as warming and as comfortable as possible. There's some things we can do with that. So one example would be how many of you, when you've made an application, have looked at the mission statement or the values of that business and aligned it with your application? Now, I use Dr. Martin's a lot of my applications because in my examples, because in their um, values and behaviors, they talk about having a rebellious and philanthropic attitude to life. Now, if I was writing an application to Dr. Martin's in that view, how many other people have written something in their summary, in their cover letter, in their email, whatever it might be, and said, look, I've read your values. I also you know, value uh, philanthropic exercises. These are some examples of the philanthropic things that I've done. I'm also quite rebellious in nature. This is an example of how, you know, no one told me I could achieve this, but I did anyway. You know, your values really resonate with me as an individual, which is one of the reasons I'm really passionate about being, you know, becoming a part of your company, rather than just applying for a job and waiting to see what comes back. I think it's really important if you're able to show, and Sue mentioned value, your value early on in the application process, it makes it much easier for hiring managers to make a quicker decision. And this starts right back to the CV um, stage. So there are so many things out there at the minute, myths is how I put them, on how people should write a CV. I've seen probably over a million in my career. That's not an exaggeration, I've done this for over 20 years. So with that many CVs that I've seen, and I've seen CV companies, CV writing companies that are taking money from individuals to change, make changes to CVs that aren't necessary. So please, please never waste your money on a CV writing firm. There are good recruiters out there that specialize in your niche who can help you for free. And it's in their interest to make your CV look good. You don't need to pay for it. And they know what hiring managers are looking for. But just break that down slightly. So the number one thing we need to do on a CV at the application process 
is to show your value early. If a job description is asking for CIPD, don't hide that on page two. Because if I'm looking at page one as a recruiter, I may not look at page two if you haven't grabbed me on page one. You need to be able to grab attention within three to four seconds. And that attention needs to be aligned with what the job is looking for. If the job needs CIPD, I need to be able to see that on your CV quickly. If the job requires specific skills or sector experience or achievements, I need to see that quickly. I also need to see where you, be, where you can add value quickly. I want, I'm not looking for a bullet point list of, tasks that anyone can do or that you have attention to detail i would assume that i'd be i'm not looking to take someone that doesn't have those those skills we take for granted what i'm looking for is someone that can show value where have you improved productivity where have you improved motivation where have you introduced cost savings or or made a change or whatever it might be let me see that early bullet point your achievements before we even get to your your current job role I need to see your value soon. I need to see it within three to four seconds and it needs to align with what the job description is looking for. So if you can do that, actually the CV writing is all about the first part of page one or page one as a whole, because if page one doesn't grab me, I won't even look at page two. Now to bring it back to Steve's point on pestering, it's an interesting question. From a recruiter's perspective, we get lots and lots of applications. So I think you should always follow up with a recruiter to say, hey, How's my application going? We never mind that because actually we get so overworked, sometimes it's impossible for us to call every single candidate. We've got 24,000 HR professionals registered with us. It's an impossibility that I can call all of those people once a week. So definitely chase up with an application with the recruiter. I would say ask the, the recruiter for a time frame and work to that. And if it's a week later, expect it to be a week. We're often waiting for hiring managers. With hiring managers themselves, there's a little bit of a trick you can do here. Now, often most people will go back to hiring managers and say, can I have some feedback on my application? It's such a broad and generalist question that usually you'll either get met with nothing or if you've been unsuccessful, it'll be something like you lost out to another candidate or whatever it might be. It's something generic that doesn't help with your application. So a bit like the goals, what is it you actually want to know? Be specific with your questions. Can you give me one piece of um, advice or, or was, there, was there one element in my CV that didn't resonate with you? What was the biggest strength you saw in my CV? What was the biggest weakness? Where did I let me know? What was the particular element that let myself down? Was there a question I didn't ask so well enough? Whatever it is that you want to know, narrow it down to one question that is not broad. If you give a recruiter or a hiring manager a specific question, you'll find that the response rate goes through the roof. And I know this as a recruiter, because when I'm trying to get feedback from my clients, I never go back to them and say, can I have feedback on a candidate? I'll say, you know, something specific related to that individual that I know will generate a response. So that's quite useful. In terms of the pestering, again, for talent acquisition teams, I wouldn't bother pestering overly because they are absolutely inundated. So that's where it can be really helpful to go direct to the hiring manager, the HRD, the, the chief people officer, whoever it might be. And I would say just one piece of communication. So say, hey, look, I've applied through the right channels. I applied 10 days ago. I've not had a response. It's a role that is really important to me. It resonates with what I want to do. I just want to make sure my CV hasn't been overlooked. Uh, if there were anything in my CV that meant it didn't get shortlisted for any reason, please let me know what that reason is. and I'll try and address it for you because I'm really keen. I think that's enough. And if you're specific enough, you'll get a response or you should get a response to your question. Um, Joe's meant, how's it best to keep in touch with agencies on the list of credible candidates? Well, definitely do keep in touch because of the numbers and volumes we're dealing with on a daily basis. It's very easy for us to remember you today and, and not, not forget because we've got tools and algorithms that make sure we don't miss skills. But this relates a little bit back to the CV. If your skills aren't visible, then you may, we may miss you in our, in our searching, the searching tools that we use. So again, you want all your skills to be listed on your CV. So our tools and our software and our algorithms pick those things up. But I would say with an agency, um, always update them on your availability. If you've got interviews elsewhere, let them know you're interviewing because actually that puts agencies under pressure. They don't want to lose you to a competitor. So if you're interviewing elsewhere, give them a call and say, look, I've got a couple of interviews lined up. I want to find out where, where I am with, with your agency because you know otherwise there's a chance I'm going to go. If you haven't got any interviews, let them know you're still available. Let them know your notice period. Think of it from a sales perspective. What are the things the the recruitment agent is looking for. We're looking for availability. We need to know your salary expectations so that we can market correctly. We need to know employers that you'd like to work for. It's very rare a candidate will phone me and say, Nick, I really want to work for these brands, but I don't want to work for these brands. Just that little bit of direction might just spark something. And you know what? I'm working with Dr. Martins at the minute, and that's a brand you'd like to work for. Let me give them a quick call. It's much easier then. You're going to be a bit more proactive with it. Um, 
And, and I'll say just be understanding that there's obviously a number of positions and candidates we're working with. It's not always possible, but I never mind a candidate phoning me. If it's daily, weekly, I don't think you can be necessarily too much. Um, but I was, you know, once a week is, 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 is more than ample. And if anything changes in your circumstance, definitely let them know. I think that's the critical piece. But personally, I don't get frustrated because with so many people we're dealing with, I much prefer the inbound calls. So, you know, it's, all, it's impossible for me to make the outbound ones. Um, so I'm going to bring it back to you, Sue, because you just mentioned that you from your program, you've actually had a, a, some really good success stories where when they, people have changed their mindset. And I know one individual in particular um, because I work with her as well. Tell us a little bit about some of the success stories, those couple you mentioned about where, where they started from and some of the, the tools and things they did to get them to that final position. Because there are some really interesting yeah. points there that I'm sure people can take away. Yeah, definitely. One of the things that we um, we talk about in the four week coaching program is integrity. Right now, um, you know, there's when we talk about integrity, you know, we think about being our word and doing what we say we're going to do when it comes to other people. But actually, often, you know, if I was to ask you, how often do you go out of integrity with yourself where you promise yourself you're going to do something and then you don't? Now, the impact of you not doing something you promised yourself is that you listen to yourself as somebody who doesn't do what you say you're going to do. Like it's in your own in your own mind, right? It's in your own head that you haven't done that. And you start diminishing your listening of you. Right. And that's what creates our lack of self-confidence. So in the program, people go away and make a list of areas that or things that they promised themselves that they should have done, that they were going to do and they haven't done. And they go away and work on that list. And as soon as they start to do that, it starts to just open up the energy around them. And I've had, um, you know, we've had people on the program who have been out of work for two or three months. They've come into the program and within two weeks, they've, you know, had a couple of interviews and they've been offered two or three opportunities. It's been incredible. I had a lady on the program who had been dealing with a traumatic experience that she'd, um, an incident she had in the past and she'd just been out of work, um, you know, feeling very sorry for herself and just out of action, really. And she came along to the program and she has been on fire, like literally within two weeks, she went and cleaned out her cupboards. She, you know, she started applying for jobs. She got about three offers by the end of the program. And she was also creating plans for a couple of business ideas that she had. And she just keeps messaging me saying, you just don't understand how liberated I feel right now. You know, so there's, you know, lots of opportunity for you when you start really creating um, a space or an energy about you that is not out of desperation, but out of, real um, ownership of your life and being proactive like Nick says you know really just being proactive around that and I just want to make a point about you know what Nick said about value you know Jim Rohn says um, something really quite profound right is and it's really simple you know is what is the difference between someone who earns 10 pounds an hour to somebody who earns 50 pounds an hour yeah the difference is they are more valuable to the organization or to people. So really think about how can you make yourselves be more valuable to any organization? Highlight what you can bring, highlight your achievements, highlight, you know, your thinking, like, you know, how you think, you know, really working on your mindset around, you know, um, rather than coming from a place of lack and scarcity and fear, come from a place of ownership, power, and really leaning into, you know what, this is what I deserve. Yeah, and this is what I'm going to bring to your organization. So really highlight your value. You know, many of us in HR are so frightened of selling ourselves. You know, I hear it a lot with HR people. I'm not good at selling myself. If you don't sell yourself, who's going to sell you? And you know, you know what, <laughs> as an agency, there's nothing more enlightening for us to hear someone come in and sell their value to us. We're then on Tento, we're like, right. We've got to get this individual out to X, Y and Z clients straight away or someone else is going to snap them up and we'll lose that commercial return. So, you know, it, it's important if you come to us with that value of yourself, it really does resonate across, you know, across all levels. And what I'd add, I mean, yeah. Sue said right at the start of this um, webinar, you know, sometimes we just forget to breathe. One thing I would say is if you're able to take a deep breath and really reassess a, what your value is that Sue's talked about, what your goals are, which are really important. Actually, there's something else you can do. And I, it's very rare that job seekers will do this in my experience. 
And that's this. Nine times out of 10, a job seeker is reactive, but they think they're proactive. So what I mean by that is they'll see an advert and they'll apply for it. And in their mind, they've been proactive and it's therefore, you know, if they don't get a response or they're unsuccessful, it's not their fault. I would say you need to go further than that. How many people on this, and put it in the chat if you've done this, fair play. I think it's a rarity. How many of you have taken a breath and actually brainstormed all of the possible options available to you to help find your next job? That includes which agencies am I going to approach and are they the right agencies for me? Are they specialist? Are they niche or are they generalist? Is it someone I get on with who I know will really work on my behalf or is it someone I don't know? How can I get to know them better? You keep brainstorming and brainstorming until you get to the point you need to get to. That's just on an agency side. What kind of job do I want? brainstorm that. What kind of applications can I make? What transferable skills do I have? Maybe it's a job I've never considered before, but actually by the time you brainstormed, new opportunities will come available to you that you've never even considered before. And they can really take you into different directions. Um, someone on Sue's course, we were talking off air recently, was a, an HR professional who came into the, 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 the program trying to find a new, HR, a new HR job and has just launched her own YouTube channel selling beauty uh, stuff because actually when she brainstormed what she wanted to do, she realized that actually the angle and the path she wanted to take was very different. And she wouldn't have done achieved that vision without the brainstorming. Brainstorming goes further than that as well. Let's not just apply for jobs. Where can we take that further? Can we write an email to the hiring manager? Does it give that give us that information? If it doesn't, can I write a personalized email to the to the talent acquisition partner that's responsible for that job? What else can I do to make my application stand out? Have I been to the website and looked at their values and their mission statements? Have I seen what where other employees have come from or what skills they look for? These are all proactive tasks. It's so easy to feel like we're not getting anywhere because we're being reactive, but we feel like we're being proactive. And what I mean is just to reemphasize, being proactive is not applying for jobs. That's something you have to do to get a job. It's, it's the minimum, it's the bare minimum you have to do. Being proactive is doing all the stuff that other job seekers are not doing. Making your CV stand out, showing your value, understanding what it is you want to do, going in with confidence, putting posts out on LinkedIn, asking your network, you know, who can help me? This is what I'm looking to do. Putting it on, putting yourself out there, joining relevant HR job seeking groups on LinkedIn and networking with relevant professionals that can help your cause. There are so many things you can all do to help yourselves find better positions, new positions, or even new directions. But it starts with that breathing, taking a step back, and then brainstorming every single outcome you can have. And then more importantly than the brainstorm, after you've done that, which I know Sue is a big fan of, is taking action. Because at that point, you will be comfortable with the decisions and the actions you're taking because you brainstorm them. You want to help you find that vision. And if you do those things, I personally think for all of you, it will work out as it should because you'll be so clear on your vision, so clear on your skill set, so clear on your value. And you'll have so many options available to you that it'll really, really enhance your ability to find a new position. Sorry to interrupt, Sue, but um, I wanted to bring that no, back. No, I think, I think that's so good. important. Yeah, I think that's so important. I think, um, like you said, you know, being proactive isn't just about, you know, applying for jobs. You know, being proactive is about doing the work on you and your mindset, you know, what does that job really look like that you want? Can you see yourself like, what kind of people will you be working with? What kind of organization, what values will they have? You know, and really doing that work is what's gonna have you be applying for the right roles. And then you will see that, you know, you won't be getting frustrated. You won't be getting rejections because actually people will wanna be listening to you because you're connected to their values and why you wanna be with them. I mean, uh, Joe mentioned you know, going back to that point, how, how much is too much about staying in touch with the agency? I think if you're being proactive, you can't you can't be in touch too much. The agency will soon direct you. I would soon say, look, Joe, I'll let you know as soon as I get some feedback. If you haven't heard from me by Thursday, give me a call on Friday. And that's absolutely fine. The parameters have been set up. But if you don't have that call with me in the first instance, I can't guarantee I'm going to call you at that point. We've got so much things going on. So you're taking action. You're then in control of that agency relationship. You're in control of that. If you want the agency to meet with you because they don't feel they can sell you well enough on your CV, then arrange a Zoom call. You know, do, do you take responsibility? There are many recruitment agents out there that I don't think do enough to get to know their candidates. So sometimes that has to come from the candidate. Say, so look, I know you've seen my CV. I know you've told me you're going to do the best you can, but I'd really like to meet you in person. I want to start a really good partnership with you because who knows where I might be in the future, right? If you're looking for an HR administrator job now, you could be an HR director in the future and become my client. So 
there's always there's always value for both parties in this, which is why I think if you if you again are proactive and say, look, you haven't met me. I think if you meet me, it'll change the way you view me. If that's something you want to do, take that action and do it. Now, Sue, I'm going to bring it back to you because you you talk a lot in your coaching about it's not just the doing and you capitalize the D and the O in doing that's going to get you the right job. You say it's the being and capitalize the BE. So it, you know, not do, but be. It's being in the right mindset that will get you the result you want. Can you expand on that a little bit for people? Yeah, 100 percent. I think, um, you know, and we all do it right. We all think about what we want to have. Like we want to have the job. We want to have the money. We want to have the house, the dog, the car, you know, the, all the perks. Right. We want to have all of these things in our life. And we're generally living our life because that's what we want to have. And when we focus on what we want to have, we end up doing certain things that we think are going to give us what we want to have. So often we're working long hours where, you know, getting really desperate. We're constantly on, you know, on the go. We don't switch off. We don't build relationships with people. We're just constantly doing, doing, doing our things to do list never go away. Right. And we put pressure on people. We don't build relationships with people. We don't actually show much compassion with people. We don't take time out for our health and our own well-being. I did a post today actually on, you know, how, how much time do you spend being joyful every day? Right. We just don't, you know, we're just constantly focused on tasks. And we do that because we think we want to have all of these things so that one day we can be joyful, peaceful, fulfilled, calm, loving. But what I say to people is that actually imagine if you were just being that now. If you were being calm, if you were being peaceful, content, happy, satisfied and fulfilled now, which you can be because all of that is just a choice. You could choose to be that anytime, right? Like right now. So if you were being that now, what kind of things would you be doing from who you're being? You'd be taking time out to think about what you really want. You'd be taking time out to build relationships with the agents, with you know previous colleagues you've worked with. You'd be taking some time out for your health and well-being, getting really grounded in yourself. You'd be taking some time out to really visualize what it is that you really do want. And what you find then is that actually to get what it is you want isn't tiring. It isn't exhausting. You know, it's a lot more simpler to get what it is you want to have. So focus on who you're being in each moment. Right. And your behaviors will be aligned to who you're being. And then you will eventually have what it is you want. So let go of your attachment to the job, to the money, the whatever that is, right? Let go of the attachment to that. Focus on who do I need to be right now? You know, just to give a quick example, right, is I've been working on um, my six pack, for example, right? Yeah. Now, you know, I could be relentlessly just constantly, you know, working out five, six hours a day, eating, you know, hardly anything, you know, just to do this, right? That's not gonna help me get the result I want and I'll be exhausted and I'll burn out very quickly. So I need to think about who do I need to become? You know, what kind of person has six pack abs? Yeah, someone who is a bit disciplined, focused and consistent. So if I just be that, what kind of things do I need to do in line with that? It just means every day I've got to do something that's going to have me be consistent, set regular habits, regular routines, and just do that. You know, and, you know, last week or a couple of weeks ago, rather, I did a 22 minute plank hold, <laughs> which is incredible. I don't even know why I did it, but I did it. It was a part of a challenge. But, you know, you, you've got to become the person that you want to be, you know, to have what it is that you want to have. Muhammad Ali writes, you know, before he became a champion, he became the champion when he wasn't already he behaved like a champion he behaved like a star you know and eventually he you know he achieved it so I think, uh, go on. a couple of comments on the side just noticed coming in from paul saying he's having a frustration dealing with recruiters who are so say so focused on sales probably need a bit more context around this paul not 100 percent sure 
whether this is seen as a good or a bad thing, if you've got a recruiter who, does that mean they're, they're really proactive and they're trying to help you find something or are they trying to push you into roles that just aren't suitable? Because there are two elements to this. If no recruiter should put you into a position that's not going to be comfortable for you, there's no point putting round pegs and square holes. It just doesn't work. Uh, and Steve just mentioned the same thing, putting uh, people into roles that you're not qualified for. That absolutely should not happen. And if you really it back to the values and your goals and know exactly what you want to achieve, then that you will actually be empowered enough to be able to say, I don't want that job. I'm not interested. Um, so at that point, you can you can kind of stop that. Um, but ultimately, if you know your goals and your values and you know exactly what you want to do, find a recruiter you build a relationship with. Partnerships are really, really important. If you have a relationship, then you can do that. It'll make it much easier. Something that I would recommend for everybody is I don't think anyone really, or very few people really leverage LinkedIn like they could. LinkedIn is a network of like-minded professionals, no matter what you are, whether you're into under bar underwater basket weaving or you're into digital design or you're into HR, there are people out there in the same boat as you, either in work, out of work, looking for work. There are so many groups and very few people are really utilizing the groups function on LinkedIn. Whatever it is you want to, you want to aspire to, 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 a, to become or to achieve, have a look at, there'll be a group out there for you on LinkedIn. Go and join those groups and network with like-minded individuals. If you do that, it will really, really help you. I mean, Sue, for example, we met through LinkedIn. I reached out to Sue. I was reaching out to set up a, a leader, an HR leaders WhatsApp group, which we did. Um, she's joined the group. We've then since done coaching together. But I was quite clear on what I wanted to achieve from that group. And I, all I did is I reached out to people that I hadn't worked with before, senior HR directors, and said, look, I'm trying to set up a group of like-minded people. It'd be great to have a conversation with you. Would you like to join? We've now got nearly 200 people in that group which I think is really, really powerful. Um, we were able to use that in many, many different ways from coaching to supporting and all those bits. But what is it you want to achieve? Because I guarantee there'll be people out there that you can network with, who you can who can empathize with you, can, can support you. Um, there are other job seekers, there are other people that will then know other people that are recruiting and networking is really powerful. So again, use LinkedIn to let your network know that you're looking for support, you're looking for a new position, this is what I'm looking for and this is what I can add. This is my value piece. These, these are my goals. Um, and really use LinkedIn. Don't be scared of it. I think something that me and Sue have done a lot of work with the individuals we've both been working with is, you know, don't be scared of LinkedIn. Utilize it. Be, be brave for 20 seconds or put your post out there. So many people will spend days and days and weeks procrastinating about their first mm -hmm. post. And, you know, they don't actually put it out there, but they do. At the time they do, they worry about it. I've had no likes. I've had no views. And it becomes an, an anxious thing. Don't worry about that. Social media is gone in an instant. Put your post out there. Hope you get some traction. Get some support. If you don't, post again. It's fine. People are not viewing it in the way that you will view your post. I think it's if you utilize LinkedIn the right way by joining groups, if you haven't done it, leave this webinar. Go and search the groups that interest you and join them and start networking with like-minded individuals. Because you know what, even if you get, let's assume you get a job, you get the perfect role, and the, one of your first responsibilities is to implement a new HR system, for example. Well, if you don't know where to start, what better place to start than LinkedIn and going, hey guys, join an HR systems group and say, I'm looking to implement X, Y, and Z system. Any feedback from users would be really useful. Any systems you can recommend that I may not have thought about. And you'll be amazed at how much advice and support is out there on LinkedIn if you use it correctly. And I think it's a really under-resourced um, tool at the minute for individuals that are out of work or are trying to find a new position. And it all ties in with that mindset shift of being proactive. So I guarantee if you start doing these things, most people aren't. You'll be in a, a low percentage minority of individuals that are being more proactive than other job seekers. And that will give you a competitive advantage. Um, Adrian just put, it's how and when you post that's important. Absolutely right. Uh, most important on LinkedIn for traction is how many people engage in the first two hours. If you have a friendship group, if you have family, ex-colleagues, whoever it is, when you post, get those individuals to like and comment within the first two hours. There is a lot of evidence to suggest the more comments and likes you get in that golden two-hour period is really what will um, really what will be what makes the difference to how how much further LinkedIn decides to share that post. Uh, there's lots of other LinkedIn tips as well, but that's probably a whole hour-long uh, webinar in itself. Sue, is there anything else you want to add or any questions from the group you'd like us to try and address while we have you here? I'm conscious of time. Um, I'm hoping we're giving you some steps to go away and implement as well. But anything that you want us to tackle while you've got us both on the on on, on the webinar or anything you want to add to 
Yeah, just while those questions are coming in, Nick, I just wanted to um, just share. So, you know, we can easily go into a victim mindset, right? When other people are not doing what we expect them to do or what we think they should be doing, like, you know, recruiters are bad or, you know, recruiters are being X, Y, Z or people are being X, Y, Z. You know, we can go into victim mode and being in that space is not going to help you manifest great things, right? Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Focus on who you need to be. Yeah, focus on what you're doing that could really open up opportunities for you. Get visible, get out there and get noticed, you know, and work on that mindset for yourself. You know, if you feel like you're a piece of meat, Paul, you're exactly going to be treated that way, right? Because we manifest, you know, if, you know, one thing that I share on my program is that everything that is outside of us you know all the people all the circumstances outside of us are a, a reflection of who we are and our thoughts so people are only mirroring what we already think and believe so create a real positive vibe about you create that awesome energy about you and you will manifest those opportunities and people in your life if those recruiters aren't aligned to your values you need to move on, yeah, because they will do what they do. But you need to say, actually, is this what I deserve? If it isn't, move on. It's like in any profession as well, right? There are good recruiters. There are some not so good recruiters. Totally. Some great HR professionals. There are some not so good. We all got our own values and different values, and we'll treat everything differently. Um, hopefully, from my perspective, this is going to be uh, useful for you guys. We're trying to support those that have been affected by what has been a horrendous pandemic. Um, I've just dropped my email into the chat. If you, uh, Adrian, you mentioned about joining the group, drop me an email through. We'll have a chat about that. Um, if we can help with anything else, drop me an email through as well. And obviously, uh, or contact Sue. Um, and again, if you want to, any of you want to drop, drop me a LinkedIn connection um, request, that's my email address. Send it over to me. I'd be more than happy for anyone on this call to join my network as well if you find that useful. Um, we're here to support and help. Um, so just to reiterate, obviously, I'm from JJ Recruitment. We are a specialist human resources recruiter. So if you are looking for a new position at the moment and you work in HR, again, there's my email address. Drop us through an email with your CV and one of my team will give you a call and hopefully give you a much better experience, Paul, to helping you finding your, your next role. Awesome. I'd like to mention your, your coaching courses, Sue, but I'll leave that for you to uh, to mention. Yes, for sure. I was just going to say um, just thank you to everybody who's attended the webinar today. And um, please do connect with me on LinkedIn and um, look out for details in January. So we're looking at around the third, third week of January to launch something new and exciting from the leadership, the HR Leadership Academy. So, yeah, look out for that. Natasha, I know you've just said about um, getting details from the program. Please connect with me and I'll um, share those with you. But, yeah, third week of Jan, watch this space. Excellent. Well, let's not do that. And there's no more questions coming through. That pretty much wraps us up for the session. So I hope it's been useful. I hope there's some things you can take away. Go and start your brainstorming. Get familiar with your, with your goals. Find out exactly what it is that you value, what it is you really want to do. Start making those connections start taking control it's all about control show your value in your cv show your value in the interviews be proactive and hopefully all of you uh, will no longer need to come back to a webinar like this in the future because you all have found that dream role going forward it may not be in hr once you've gone through your value proposition piece but uh, whatever it is you decide to do i wish everyone the absolute best of luck and uh, i hope you all you know very prosperous in, in whatever you decide to do next same thank you everyone thanks everyone goodbye